Our topic is repentance. Now, we're going to look at the concept of repentance from a biblical perspective. The very idea of repentance is central. It's found at the root of all scripture. The New Testament opens with a message, and it's very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, John began with this message, and Jesus even continues the very same message. Even the apostles preached the message of repentance. Repent and be baptized. So, we're going to go over this through the course of this teaching. Uh, but before we continue to press on, we want to get a technical understanding of a water ball repentance. And for that, we're going to visit our chalkboard. And we're going to look at this word metanoia. Metanoia in the New Testament is the word for repentance in the Greek language. Now, kacha waraba metanoia, repentance, it's two Greek words, as you could see on the left and right of your screen. It's two Greek words combined to bring one understanding. Now, let's look at the first part meta. Meta, for example, is used in a word you might be familiar with metaphysics. Uh, now, physics alone is something visible, perceivable, something physical. But when you add meta, metaphysics, uh, to the first part of it, uh, it's something that reaches beyond physics. So, what does meta mean? Meta could be with, beside, or after. So, it comes with something, beside something, or after something. That's the basic understanding for meta. Now, the second part of metanoia which is noia let's look at that now for the theologians at the top we added the breadcrumbs uh, noia brings us to noio which is noose what does it mean it simply means the mind or in context of scripture the soul so that's the technical understanding for those two parts of uh, those greek words that bring us to the word repentance in the new testament so putting them together what understanding do we get? What does it mean? Metanoia could mean in a technical sense, the mind afterwards. But understanding that in context of scripture could be an afterthought or a significant changing of one's mind. Now, the most central part of repentance, at the root of repentance in the entire Bible, is the call for one to change one's mind or to change one's soul. But it goes a little deeper than that. Metanoia is not only an intellectual judgment call. It's not just san de goji. Uh, for instance, one example would be if I'm crossing the road, I mobilia velte del mandal. Well, I just made a judgment call. I've made an intellectual judgment or an assessment that Gachamo Bidi City Delman Dab. But you see, that judgment call is not my action or my reaction to what I've made an assessment of. Now, bringing that back into the context of the study, if one comes to the intellectual judgment, Gai Drobul repentance on the Lescotrayo, that right there is just his judgment call. But repentance is not only just a judgment call, it's also something that requires action or a reaction after someone has come to the understanding, Gudrabul, repentance. So, metanoia, repentance, is the changing of one's mind with respect to one's behavior or lifestyle. Repentance is a lifestyle, and rather you are repentant or not, your lifestyle will bear fruit to the fact rather so repentance on the trial or not. Metanoia, repentance, also carries the idea of ruing. Sosukacha warba ru. To ru is to regret a particular action. It's to be remorseful. It's to regret your sin. Repentance is not only intellectual, as we said before, but it's also emotional hurt. The feelings of a person are involved. Repentance could have some of these feelings. The feelings of repentance could be remorse, regret, sorrow, 
grief, brokenness, desperation to undo an action or a sin if we could. One example in the New Testament is Peter. The remorse and sorrow he felt when he denied Christ three times. He was broken until he repented. Uh, you could find on the bottom we added the scriptures. It's Luke chapter 22 and also John uh, 21. Uh, in Luke 22, Peter denies Christ. Uh, we know that story. And in John 21, Jesus restores Peter. Uh, but in that time, in that transition, Peter was broken. Peter was filled with remorse, with sorrow. So this is an example of the heart of someone who comes to repentance. So that's the technical understanding of a warba metanoia, repentance. And now we're going to jump right back into our study. The idea of repentance is deeply rooted in Old Testament Israel. Now the concept of repentance in Old Testament times sometimes makes the distinction between two kinds of repentance and we're going to look at those both. The first kind of repentance is cultic or ritualistic repentance and the second kind is prophetic repentance. So let's look at that first one, cultic or ritualistic repentance. Now, the term cultic can be very misleading at this point uh, because we might think of cults or something that's off-center or a heretodox or heretical group, but let's get the technical understanding of Gacha. What about cultic? Cultic, when used in a technical sense, especially in theology, refers not to cults, but to the behavioral patterns or the religious life of a community so there's nothing negative here about the term cultic it's good to remember uh, God is the one who institutes the cultist of Israel he defines how the people are to behave morally religiously uh, that is how to pray offer sacrifice uh, ministrations of the temple and so on uh, that's all part of the ritual or the cultic practices of the nation of Israel so there's that technical understanding body of Ikwarba Gaibushal cultic that we're going to use throughout the process of uh, this teaching. Uh, when we look at the Old Testament, there are many practices, uh, but in this study, we're going to be specifically concerned with repentance and the purpose of repentance and also these types of observations in the Old Testament. Once God had become angry with the nation, uh, then sometimes the people were called upon to do certain things to satisfy God's anger so that his anger would be turned aside and the people would be forgiven of their sins and peace with God be restored to the community. The ritual of penitence or repentance sometimes included the following. A general or national fast, the renting of one's garments, sackcloth and ashes and also the lament now we're going to go through each one of these and we're going to visit them and just talk about them in detail a little bit a general or national fast the prophets might come for example and call the people to a solemn assembly and when the assembly was called everyone was required to attend that is men women and children and then the prophet would speak and announce God's judgment to the people and a call for a general fast as a national sign of repentance in order that God might turn his wrath away from the people. Uh, now let's look at the renting of one's garments. The second element we find in the Old Testament involved clothing. Uh, and these particular actions were associated with the process of mourning. Now, we remember when David's child took sick that David tore his clothes, he rent his garments. Uh, Sosukako rent his garments. Uh, body, uh, we're visiting the chalkboard, get a technical understanding, and it's very simple. To rent one's garments is to tear or rip them apart. Uh, so that's what the, the term to rent one's garments or someone rented uh, their garments. So 
We see this in the Bible when people are grief stricken. They express their grief by ripping their clothes. And then to add to the tearing of garments, the other part associated to repentance was not only the rending of garments, but also the donning of sackcloth and ashes. Uh, sackcloth and ashes. Uh, it's a coarse cloth on the bodies that was most uncomfortable. Again, this was a sign, a mark of repentance. Uh, so they would tear their clothes, put on the sackcloth, and then take ashes and would either sit in an ash heap or take ashes and spread them on their clothes, on their forehead, or the top of their heads. Uh, all of this was by way of ritual and was a sign of self-abasement. Uh, and that's all part of the tradition of ancient Israel. And now we're looking at the lament. The changing of clothing is designed to indicate symbolically the change of heart or the change of of mind. We suggest that you read Romans 12 2 and note that it's a call to repentance. So to repent is to become divergent. Divergent is a word that uh, you should look into and get an understanding, but it basically means so that you can learn to develop in a different direction. That's the understanding. So to repent is also to be divergent, which is to have a lifestyle that allows you to develop in a different direction. Now we come to the verbal element that would be associated with the lament, a kind of song which was the lament. The lament was an expression of grief. The lament would be used when somebody died or a catastrophe took place. So people would sing the lament as a sign of repentance. Now, we have a whole book in the Bible written by a man who is known as the Weeping Prophet, and his name was Jeremiah. And then we have the shorter book called the Book of Lamentations. And there, Jeremiah is lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem, the result of God's judgment upon the nation, because they were impenitent, non-repentant. True penitence or repentance was to be expressed with the lament, a song of grief and sorrow accompanied by loud cries and wailing. In the New Testament, there are occasions where we see Jesus raising people from the dead. And in one of those occasions, the funeral process is already in process and they have professional mourners. There are people who were paid to carry out these rites and rituals in the event of the death of a loved one. They were good actors and they would wail and cry and carry on and beat their chest and add on sackcloth and ashes to express this cultic form of lament. Again, the same kind of activity was associated with the ritual of repentance. Now the second kind of repentance, which we'll talk about later, is called prophetic repentance. Now the prophets did not despise the rituals that God ordained that the people used to express themselves. But the prophetic repentance was a judgment upon Israel for the cultic practices when it produced a mere externalism, where people would just go through the motions of repentance, but their repentance lacked real sincerity. It didn't come from the heart. And so, in the age of the great prophets, they emphasized the need for godly sorrow that is genuine and comes from the heart. In the Old Testament, we've seen that there were certain practices and rituals that God instituted for His nation Israel by which people could express themselves, verbalize, and demonstrate their sorrow for sin. Now I have a question. How do you do that? How do you show a broken heart for having offended God? How do we demonstrate that? in the life of the church. Sometimes on Sunday we have a corporate prayer known as the sinner's prayer. And then the pastor assures us that we have been pardoned. But it seems we have lost our way of showing and having a genuine godly repentance and for our life to bear fruit of that repentance. I think we suffer the consequences of that because we don't know how to demonstrate 
godly repentance. And of course, the main thing is that it comes from the heart. Now we've looked at already in this subject of repentance at the rituals that the Jewish people followed in the Old Testament, the cultic practices of the appointed day of fasting in the day of repentance, in changing of one's clothes and the wailing and the laments that were a part of this process. But particularly, I mentioned prophets of the 8th and 7th century, people like Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, Isaiah. These people would remind them that the kind of repentance that God demands is a repentance that comes from the heart. And the bottom line was this, rend your hearts and not your garments. To this man Shalling to Tosbima, Tena Pabolo Ka, Chosun Tadu Hotel Manzo, Tijavangle.